You're on. All right. Uh, I think I can hear my own voice. Is everybody okay with the sound? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Ed, uh, Jerry, the, and all the people that put this thing together. It, it, what a privilege uh, to come out and, and talk to you a little bit. I have been told by all my friends to come to see this museum and come to see it. And you know how there's so many things that they're right around the corner because I live in Virginia Beach. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that next week uh, as soon as and something else happens. And I, I've been going to come for two and a half years. Uh, several people who told me I needed to come are out here right now. But next week has finally arrived for me. And it, it's just a privilege to be here and, and an honor to uh, talk to you. I want to go back a little bit uh, before I get into the real story you came or you want me to say I guess. Uh, in uh, October of this past year uh, I went to my third reunion of the group of aviators that uh, flew with me off the Intrepid in 1966. Uh, we had our first reunion about early 2002 or three or something like that and every three years I've had one since and it's, it's like it's an incredible bonding that, that we had with that group. Uh, it was just a unique uh, unique group. But, uh, Having just been to that and experienced it, last night, one of the guys that I met in October told me he was a Duke fan, and so were my wife and I, and he had season tickets. Well, last night I flew, I drove back to Raleigh, and we went to watch Duke beat Wake Forest, uh, credit to his season tickets. So anyway, the point of all of that is, when I come in here and I looked out and talked to a bunch of you already, I'm, I'm looking so many people I already know, many of you have met here today, that I knew or crossed paths with back in the Navy 40 some years ago. So this is, I had no idea this was gonna feel like a reunion for me, but it, it really kind of does. Uh, but let me also preface my remarks with the following. Uh, all the pilots I've ever known and respected, no matter what they ever did or happened, and we love to tell sea stories, but braggadocia doesn't go. So I, I, I've, I've always, you know, tried to tell this unique story that I was involved in in sort of an all shucks way. But recently, in the last 10 years, I've had several opportunities to talk to a group about it, and I realized that's not really what they want to hear. <laughs> I, I want to tell an accurate story that I think is interesting, but I want to tell it in a way that is uh, is right and interesting. And the only way I can do that and not feel like I'm out of place is it's about a guy I used to know. It's not me anymore. But the guy I used to know had some very uh, unusual circumstances that I think brought me to this unusual situation that, that happened. Uh, and, and I think there's two things that I would like to leave you with. One is the story. Hey, what really happened? How'd you shoot a MiG down? But two, is there anything relevant in that story to life in general? I think there is. I didn't realize it at the time, but I've got to go back a little bit and tell you about the 25-year-old, the 26-year-old I was then that, that this happened to. I grew up on a farm in West Virginia. I went to a little school, very sheltered school in South Carolina at college. I got out. A year later, I went to the Navy. I, I literally wanted to see the world. I was tired of a, of a nine to five desk job. I just wasn't ready for that. I, I, didn't, I never wanted to fly. I didn't know about flying. I get up to OCS and uh, somebody starts talking about things you could do in, in addition to riding around on a ship. And one of them was fly airplanes. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And I, I got in line, took a test. They said, hey, go and take it. Pretty soon I was going to Pensacola to fly. Thought, wow, that sounds cool. And I kind of felt like Willie Mays when he went home and told his mama, he's 18 years old, so I think this is a legend, but he said, mama, I, I'm going to get to play baseball, and, and they pay me too. Well, I thought, when they told me, you're going to get to fly, and you get extra pay too? Whoa, that's cool. So uh, that was important for me to relate to you because when I get to the story, I'm going to tell you that I think my naiveness, and I was very naive, it created a, a, an atmosphere that a lot of the rest of us had in this squadron where we believed we could do anything. We, we, we had so much self-confidence, not cockiness. Uh, I, I never respected the the guy Tom Cruise was in Top Gun, for example. Now, to me, that wasn't, that, that's not the kind of pilot you, you admire. But we were extremely confident of what we could do. Uh, I was naively confident, and a lot of little things happened in the squadron early on that kind of 
gave me that confidence. Uh, I became an LSO at an early age, and people were trusting me, and I'm, I'm, I thought, wow, this is cool. Well, when we got orders to Vietnam on the Intrepid, we spent uh, weeks, a month or so, steaming over there, went through the Suez Canal. And this is, this is for those of you that have flown, I was in a, the Sky Raider was an attack plane. Its mission was to post air support or put targets on the ground. Not a fighter plane, obviously. It had max speed of about 270-something and straight and level. Uh, carry a lot of ordnance. Nevertheless, this naive farm boy who didn't know any better, I used to dream. Now, by, by the way, we were going over with specific mission of operating off of what we call Dixie Station. For those of you that know, there was a Yankee Station, Dixie Station. At that time, the war, all, air war and up north had already been going on and all that. Uh, but Dixie Station was for close air support only. And that we took a, a, an air wing with two Sky Raider SPAD squadrons, mine gun one of them, and two A4 squadrons. All they, we could do was drop bombs and rockets and shoot guns and no, no fighters, no ECM, no, no electronic countermeasures. And uh, halfway through our crews, after two line periods, they determined correctly that we really, the Navy really wasn't that effective at close air support because we had to operate the carrier so far offshore because the water was so shallow. And it's hard to respond to needs, so we, it was an inefficient way to provide what could be provided by planes on the ground. Well, they had us over there, and they said, well, we're going to send you up north. And you were kidding me. They got missiles up there and all that. We don't have any ECM. We don't have any fighters. They got bloody wow. Oh, don't worry. We'll coordinate with the other two carriers, and you'll have all that coverage. Hmm. Okay, fine. Uh, and they also said, uh, you know, we're going to show you where all the snow and sand sites are, and you draw big circles there, and you, you don't fly there. Well, when we got done drawing the circles and the bunch of maps, there wasn't anything left. <laughs> and uh, the... The, uh, the impressive thing there is we were able to, I, I, think, uh, I think we're good at what we did, we were able to operate uh, both, all four squadrons over the north. We lost one plane and don't ever let anybody trouble us. Oh, you only lost one plane? Yeah, we lost one plane off my squadron. We lost one off the other one. Uh, I mean, the other uh, SPAD squadron. Uh, and he, he was recovered. My good friend and roommate was not. So. Losing one, it still goes deep. But anyway, uh, we operated up there for a while. Uh, and to go on in now, and I'll, 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 I'll kind of get a little specific about what happened on uh, October, it was October of 66. Uh, uh, we had uh, several missions up there. The, the best mission for this bad up there was rescue. Uh, and there were a number of, you know, pilots got shot down, a few got rescued. And, and in almost all cases, you made maximum effort to rescue somebody, uh, which meant taking a helo in and trying to pick them up. The SPAD was the helo escort, the helo's armed guard to try to facilitate a pickup, both by protecting him and also protecting the aviator if you're picking him up off the ground by creating enough of distraction with your four 20 millimeters that we had, two on each side and each wing, plus any rockets we might carry. Uh, so every, every day, there were always two spads airborne with a helo, standard rescue in case one came up. You have to be up and ready. But on this particular day, there was a uh, three-carrier coordinated strike that was going to go in in waves. And I don't remember the target, but it was somewhere obviously a big target, and I think there are like 60 planes going to be involved, and because of the high number of uh, the strike, uh, the high number of planes and the, and the tough target they were going after, the odds were that somebody's going to get shot down. It's a good chance. So they launched a four, a four, four plane with a, with a helo and stationed us uh, right off the coast at the entry point that they would be going in and out, so we would be the closest proximity if we had to go in and pick somebody up. In the meantime, we still had the regular rest cap out, so they were at a different place uh, for whatever reason, because there were some other things going on. Well, this was a double cycle for us, and a, a carrier cycle is typically an hour and a half. You launch an hour and a half later, there's another cycle, an hour and a half later. So. The SPAD was well known for ability to fly for many long hours. I was fortunate we never did that very often. We normally cycled with the same cycle the jets were on. I didn't develop a 
what you normally develop from flying on a hard seat for too long. But we had a three hour that day, a uh, double cycle. And we orbited with this helo. You know, when you've done this for two hours and a half, it gets really, really boring. And, and when, the, when the last wave was coming back out, no one had bit the dust yet. Uh, no, uh, uh, and, and everything looked good. And you know, you're looking at your watch, and in about five minutes, you're going to be heading back to the carrier and another boring hop. And all of a sudden, we got this call, and a guy named Leo Cook was my flight leader. Uh, and I'll talk about these guys, so I'll introduce them. Leo was a commander, ops, uh, the ops officer, great, great, great guy. He was a flight leader. His wingman was the junior guy, Jim Wiley Buzz. And I was number four flying wing for a section leader named Pete Russell. Pete and I were paired up as a team three-fourths of the time. We just were a team. Unfortunately, all three of these guys are dead today, which I, I miss them a lot. Uh, he got shot down later uh, on another uh, deployment that he volunteered for in something called an OB-10. Leo died of natural causes not long ago, and Jim died this past May. Uh, we, we were trying to get a reunion for him, but I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute because they all had big roles to play in what happened. So somebody called uh, 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 that a uh, a shoot was seen coming out of a Phantom, and if you know about a Phantom, it was a jet fighter there that carried two people. They only had one shoot, so presumably uh, we don't know what was the pilot or the RIO, don't know. We just knew there was a shoot. And it was, the location was somewhere about 25 miles southwest of Hanover. That's all we heard. Leo immediately asked the Hilo, could you get there and back? Do you have enough fuel? About 20, 30 seconds later, he came back with the answer, I, I can, with 10 minutes to spare, with no reserve. In other words, you're, you, you, if you take more than 10 minutes to, to affect the pickup, you probably won't make it all the way back. Given that, and given the fact that we didn't know if the guy was alive and made contact, we, whether his feet were even on the ground, I guess they were by then. But we just knew there was a shoot. And, and I'm gonna bring this up because if you think about it, to endanger the lives of a whole uh, helo crew, force beds, uh, under circumstances that are gonna be highly problematic. You gotta wonder in, in, in a rational world, was that smart? I, I can promise you that Leo made the same decision that Pud and I and, uh, and, and Pete would have made. But it was his decision, we'll go. And, and because you didn't assess odds if you were going to be one of the ones that was shot down. The success is going to depend on whether you get there in five minutes, not seven, or seven, not nine. So we, we headed in. And the prearranged plan for that type of thing would be Leo and Pud, the, the, the flight leader, would go on hit. But they could bore on in there quickly and try to find this, the, the guy on the ground. We would come with the helo, and he's doing 110 knots or maybe and we would escort him by S-turning back and forth to stay with him. Pete, my section leader, would go in front, the helo behind and me behind him. Pete's role is to navigate. Well, knowing the fuel situation, we didn't have the luxury of navigating around any AAA or SAMs or anything else. We got to go as direct as we can. Uh, in the meantime, we were, had been orbiting down about 3,500 feet or something like that because we don't want to be in the way of anybody coming out but we don't want to go in at 3,500 feet. Normal for the helo, we've got to take him in above 10,000 because AAA gets to be a lot less effective there. And so we climbed up and now we're going in. The first thing that happened that was uh, pretty exciting is I'm back here, stepped up on the helo, and I'm just turning, and as soon as his nose and my nose crossed the coast, Something happened that I hadn't seen before and haven't seen since, but if you've seen World War II movies of the flak of Germany and stuff like that, uh, where you see the poof and brown and grace puffs, we encountered a flak barrage that didn't have any tracers, which means they're set to go off up here, that the visibility went down to like, you know, if you were talking about IFR condition, it was just everywhere, above us, below us, and everything. And it, it, it was like, Got real cotton mouth, you know, like there's a helo in front of me, but I can't even see him. And, uh, but I don't, all of a sudden I uh, looked up and he looked like he was coming towards me. And I've never had the pleasure of meeting him because he was off another carrier and I'd love to look him up someday. I just real quickly 
Green Lund, come, come right, come right, come back to the west. And then I kind of realized, I don't know if he was disoriented or had decided he couldn't get through. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I would, we had so much respect for the helos because you may think what we're doing is a little bit dangerous. How would you like to fly at 110 knots over to 25 miles southwest of Hanover and try to pick a guy up? I mean, this guy had done it before and he did it since and the whole crew. So anyway, he did though. He, he turned right and came back. He, he, he obeyed me <laughs> for whatever reason. And, I, and then I thought, you better do something besides give orders. Like, Look, you know, you got, we, we had four guns, but I had kind of forgotten this until recently. And I, in one of my reunions, I'm talking to my gunner officer, who was a warrant officer who was in charge of the gunnery department. He had come over to me that day and said, you got a hydraulic leak in one of your guns, but I've wired it out. He said, okay, will you take the plane? And he knew I'd take anything in the flies, I sure. So I had three guns instead of four. But I thought, oh my God, I flipped on two of them. And I roll over and I, 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 I know what am I going to do? I mean, this gun didn't go hard. So I go down and I, there's no tracers. You don't see any fire on the ground. You just got the ground. And I started rattling off a few rounds. Uh, I think I made two runs on a saddle. Remember that for sure. But I zoomed back up, back down again. And then I zoomed back up. And, and, and by that time, uh, the helo had kind of, the, the cloud we were in, he popped out. And, uh, I, I guess the only thing I might have done there is help his morale out a little bit. He saw I was doing something, but there was nothing I could do. I was down there dueling with the ground. Uh, I, I asked him if he was okay. He said he took some hits in the, hail, in the tail section, but nobody was wounded and he was still fine. So we take on off, and by now, uh, even telling us, might get me kind of cotton mouth, but uh, I was really dry. And the next thing is something funny. Uh, if you can imagine anything humorous happening in that situation, we're, 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 the flock is kind of going behind us. We don't see any more. We settle down. We're still at 10,500. <sighs> and a very short time later, we heard Pud's voice, number two man, who's up with flight later. And we've been hearing something funny calls, and break right, break right. And we thought, that sounds like we're under attack. Uh, Finally, Pud caught his breath a little bit, and he called up to Pete. And uh, Pete, I guess he called, uh, we got four MiGs on us in here. Get some fighter cover in. Well, Pete had already heard the calls and figured out what was going on. And he had called our controlling ship, Red Rider or something, whatever it was. And Red Rider had come back and said, remember, we had no fighters of our own. The fighters were off of the other ship. He said, the fighters are having trouble locating their tanker and they won't be there for at least 25 minutes. I personally suspect that they weren't ever looking for the tanker because their flight was over. They're out of fuel. They're, they're probably Atlanta. Nobody actually passed along the idea that, you know, but I don't know. But anyway, Pete said the following, and this is the funniest thing, and it had an important effect. Pete, uh, uh, Pud, my, my number two man, who's under attack, he had three on him. The leader, Leo, had gotten broken off. Now here again, you know, flight integrity would normally mean you're supposed to stay as a section. But when you're down there looking for somebody, or when we're escorting the helos, you can't fly as that. We're miles apart, you know, or a mile apart anyway. Bud had gotten three of them, and Leo had gotten one up the valley somewhere. We do not know what happened to Leo. He's never talked about it. <laughs> our, our joke is they went up there and called the truce. That, that, that's, their, that's our joke to him. Uh, Pud, though, has been worn out by these guys who are taking turns on him, and he's going back and forth, back and forth. He, uh, and I don't know if this happened right before or right after the call. It was probably right after the call for help. But uh, he actually got a probable kill because he was down real low, dodging rugged mountain peaks, and he, he, he went, he broke left around a, a jagged peak in the big was coming at him, broke right, and then came back around in front of him. And he sawed off the end of one of his wings, and the guy left trailing a lot of vapor. I'll come back to that in a minute. So anyway, it's going. Uh, Pud had said, get some fighter in here. We've got, I got three wings on me. Pete came back with the following line. Pete was from Boston. He had a Boston accent. Pud was from Arkansas. He had enough uh, leadership in him to understand Pud was upset. And so he came back in his Arkansas twang, not his Boston accent. He said, 
Roger, bud, no problem. We're on our way with two spads and a helo. <laughs> and that's exactly how it came out. Now me, farm boy from West Virginia, uh, I never did finish telling you about one more ingredient. On the way over there, I'm gonna interrupt the story right now. On the way over there, I had actually laid up and awake in my bed and dreamed of engaging me. We're, on, we're, we're going to be on Dixie Station, where they're really going, not going to be, me, it's number one, and up north, if there are any, the fighters are going to be. And we're not supposed to be. That's all I was thinking about, though. It's, it's this stupid farm boy that thought he could get mates. I also had one other ace in the hole. I had, ever since I've been in the squadron, which wasn't that long, but I've had several opportunities in the last nine months to engage our jets. And I kind of kept a chip on my shoulder, like, you know, they think, you know, they get all the, all the glory and everything, and, you know, we can do a lot too. So I had a number of occasions where I had jumped on Phantoms and A4s and uh, had some experience if they wanted to play games with us. Uh, so anyway, come back to this. Uh, when Pud said that, and he came back with Roger run away with two spades and a helo, the cotton mouth I had, the tension I had, just went out. And given where we were, all of a sudden I relaxed. I said, shit, Pop, he's right. We're going to kill those bastards, you know. And it just stayed relaxed. And uh, I, I would never have been that relaxed if he hadn't been that funny. So we're going up, and a short time later, I'm looking, I'm looking. I see, over the corner of my eye here, I would say a couple miles away, I can see these bigs coming down. I, I can see the puffs coming out of the guns. I'm close enough to shoot the gym still. That was probably about the time he got his one. I don't know. Uh, and, and, and then I kind of lost sight. I'm checking where the helo is and everything else. The helo, I'm thinking, oh my God, he's going to have a good show. And I kind of quit watching him, moved over, and all of a sudden I looked down and I saw a big on the ground coming directly at me like this. I'm a 10,500. And here's why it's not that big a whoop over the fact that he was in a jet and I was in the scout. Got right at 270, something like that, up here. I've been at max power that we can operate at. I flipped the other two guns on and I knew what I had to do because I've done it before. I've got a split S on top of this guy and I've got a time or two exactly right. But one, two, 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 two guns on, three guns on, all three of my guns are on, and split S down and he's coming this way and he hasn't seen me. Well, I don't care what you're flying, nine-tenths of the battle is that you see him first and you have altitude. So I can convert my altitude to a lot of airspeed. And I came out and you got to now call my fighter battle in hand and say, here we are like this. And I'm over like this. And I came out like this. And here he is. He's getting ready to pass him in the nose. And you come around like that. And I get right here. And almost an idea of not fighting. I'm still pulling just a little bit. But I got to get his attention. He hasn't seen me yet. So I start firing. And I don't know exactly where the tracers went, but I think I let him too much, because I think I saw the tracers going over here, but it got his attention. Well, if, 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 you, if you're him, what are you going to do if you look back and you see a guy like this and you see that? You ain't going to turn that way. You're going to turn into him. I knew he was going to turn into him. And I knew when I started to split ass, and this is the part I wanted to make very clear. I used to tell it like that everybody assumed that well, you know, he must have got a lucky pass or something else had to I knew from the time I started to split S, he was dead. I was that confident. And this is not me bragging, this is me talking about the guy I used to know. He never had a chance, in my opinion. Because if you can get in that conversation on the guy, he, he, what he actually did was pull into me, I went up. I'm probably matching his airspeed right now. I, I saw 380 out of a split S from 10,000. He came up like this, and I went like this. And his instincts were, I've got to be overshooting, which I expected he would do. He rolled like this, and I went like that, like that, and he doesn't know where I am. I'm looking directly up his tailpipe. I take a deep breath, and then I press the trigger. I get plenty of time. I run the tracers right up his tailpipe. And all of a sudden, my gun's quit firing. And I'm sitting here, oh, 150 feet, maybe, something like that. I don't know what you'd call 30 yards on a football field, maybe 20, right behind his tail, where you want to be, and my gun's all the way. We're armed. The only other thing we had, which is terrible armor, 
for a close air support, or uh, uh, not close air support, but uh, rescue. We, we had five inch Zuni rockets. We, we carried sometimes this 19 pod, a little small ones, but a, a Zuni rocket is an uncontrolled rocket. It's going to go where you aim it. You'll never hit an airplane with it. So, but anyway, I had nothing left. I picked it twice and went, whoo, whoo, and make a big noise. One went right on, one right under, and then he flipped. I don't, he, looking back on it, I know his engine is quick. You put enough 20 millimeter right up the tail, it's going to quit. But there was no explosion or anything. I hadn't actually penetrated any fuel cells other than his actual engine. And he flipped over and pulled down like this to go back. And we were flying above a big cloud cover. And uh, he went into the clouds. And I cut my pepper back on him just as he went in the clouds falling through. And I pickled off the, uh, one more Zuni, which went in the clouds after him, which I've always thought, you ought to tell the story that the Zuni got him in the clouds. <laughs> I can't swear it didn't, but <laughs> it would be one in a million if it did. So I go in the clouds. Upside down, chasing him, having fired my last Zuni at him. Still not sure the guns have done their trick. How do, you, how do you escape that? I know I saw pieces of his tail falling off. Well, I get on the gyro instruments, I'm pointing down, and I pull out right above, about 500 feet above the ground, below this overcast, and all I saw was directly beam me. Up the corner of my eye, a, 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 a seat going up. I didn't even wait for the shoot. To deploy. Uh, it, 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 there's probably somewhere out there some fighter pilots in the, in, in the uh, audience, and if, if, I, if I took the time to ask them, when are you the most vulnerable? It's right after you have gotten a kill. Because he's got a wingman somewhere that's probably on your tail. So as soon as I saw that shoot, I went into a 90 degree bank and started pulling hard, and I was actually hoping there's no one back there. But uh, I said, Pud, you, I got one, you got any more? And uh, he didn't hear me, I don't think, but there weren't any more, and uh, I, I didn't wait around to see what the price was or wasn't worried about the credit or anything else. I just knew I saw a shoot, and when I thought about it after I got back on the ship and everything, and many years later, it's obviously that his engine had quit right here. And I guess the reason he went down low was he didn't want me to be able to shoot him down in the, in the ship. Nobody ever talked about what that protocol is all about, but I can tell you, the only thing I would have ever done is dip my wing to him, and I suspect most pilots would have done the same thing. I don't know. I went about this. <laughs> He's low priority now. I, I went out to kill pilots. I was out to kill planes, uh, in my dreams anyway, and I did. Uh, and what, a, what an incredible opportunity that was, but the rest of the story is worth hearing, because I don't think at that point, even though I sound really confident today about the ability I had, I, I think I had given the situation. Now, if I was down low and he was up high, I wouldn't be so confident. But given, if you put me in that situation again, I think I'd have the same results. I, I, I just had no doubt. I suspect, though, that my naive confidence, if, 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 if given, and this is where I think there's a lesson in life, when you go into something that hypothetically is difficult, if your mind is thinking about what could go wrong, it will. If your mind is thinking, you might not pull this off, you won't, probably. But if you have no doubt in the world that you can do something, you probably will. I just think that is applied to me in, in, other, in other areas, but I, I just have no doubt about that. What, what came on next, though, and, and, I, and I ended up in a silver stock. Okay. I will tell you quite frankly, most people that get medals will tell you they don't mean much. Well, why somebody would get a silver star to shoot the plane down, I have no idea. He really shouldn't. I'm not even sure it's the DFC. I mean, yeah, it took a little skill and all that, but I guess the reason I did is because it was so unusual. Well, it was so unusual because you still don't get that kind of opportunity, but I don't think there's anything you should get a big medal for. But what came next? I will tell you that if anybody wanted to give me a medal for, I'll accept it. What came next was the scary part. There was nothing scary about the big part. The flak was pretty scary, but it was short. Now we got a helo who's totally critical on fuel. We still haven't seen a, a, a pilot, and if there, if there was one, I know, but he was probably picked up right away as far as we know. Uh, Leo says to Pete, says, you guys take the helo, get out of here, take him back. Well, coming in, we had to come over one route, but going out, we've got to take an even more direct route to the coast because that's where the, uh, the destroyer is that he can plug into and refuel. It wasn't one he can land on, but he can drop a, his 
drove the thing down and whatever, refuel hovering. Uh, that was the way to do it. Dangerous, but they can do that. We had to get in there. We're flying now over an overcast around 8,500 feet. We go up to where the helo stayed at 10,000 or so. So Pete and I take off. Pete's on one side, I'm on the other. Now we're doing this to escort him. We're flying, it's going to be about maybe a 10 minute flight to the coast, something like that, all over an overcast. We have no ECM warning devices. And SAM missiles were a huge threat at 10,000 feet. Guns are not that big a threat up there that they had, even though they could get a barrage up there and they weren't back there. Well, we had to know that the helo needed one of us. If, 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 the only warning you got on a SAM missile was to see it with your eyes in our plane. And if you see it, it's going to come through that overcast, and you're going to have almost no time to react. But you, you take off. That's what you got to do. Then, after a few minutes, the helo comes back and says to me, he says, I'm going to have to start descending. I can't afford to stay up here because the only way I'm going to possibly get to the coast and not flame out and not run out of fuel is start descending now. And, okay. He, I don't know what he said. We probably just did it automatically. I don't even remember the discussion. The helo starts in. We start in too. And we're going to IFR now. And how do you fly IFR with a helo? You turn 30 degrees away, you count, and I don't remember exactly, you count 15 seconds or whatever, and then you resume your course, and then you keep alternating and resuming, alternating and resuming one time. Oh, well, you don't alternate the same side every time, you go back and forth. Theoretically, it works. It was the longest three or four minutes of my life, because you're in the IFR, it's totally in a cloud from 8,000 down to about 1,500 or 1,200 when we broke out, coming down very slowly, to keep going forward, and the helos maintaining his 100 knots forward speed. Where's it? We can't see him, we can't see each other, but we sure as hell can't see any guns or missiles. And none came up. Well, the reason they didn't, when you think about it, there'd been this major strike, which I, of course, had no guarantee that well, I didn't even, at the time, I couldn't figure out why we're not dead already. Uh, but apparently, they fired out all of the missiles they had at the previous strike, and they hadn't reloaded. Thank God. Uh, so, Three or four minutes later, I don't know, I can't tell you for sure, something like that. We broke out, I looked down, and all of a sudden I started to like, see the waves, and there's the beach, and, there, and we're down about 1,200 feet. The helo is right there, and we're right here. God gave us a lot of luck, and just the naive approach to do something that should be almost impossible, because we just did it, and did it, precisely according to the clock, and it worked. Uh, but I, 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 I look back on it, and that is the scariest thing I've ever done. Craziest thing I've ever done, but it was the right thing. You might say, well, why don't you just stay up here? Ah, our mission is to protect the helo. She don't want to go back and get on the ship and say, you, you shot a big down, but you didn't do anything else. In, in fact, there's been people that shot MiGs down over there because they left their position to chase them down. There is a name that I can mention that is controversial. Well, I'm not going to mention it. It's controversial for other reasons that did that. And a lot of these fighter pilot friends kind of, now you may have a little jealousy there, but you, you know, if your mission is to protect the helo, it was okay that I took a little time out to mess with the MiG, I guess, uh, you know, technically, because he could... It could have done damage to a helo, that's for sure, but we, we had to do what we had to do. And uh, I uh, have, was asked by Ed if I could talk for about 45 minutes, and I told him I can talk for four or five hours if you want. And you all have been very, uh, uh, very kind. I don't see anybody sleep yet, but I would like to let anybody ask a question if they have a couple of something. Do my fill down here on the station. Questions? I had one five inch Zuni left, as I recall. The, the guns quit all at once. Remember, I had three, which means I had two that fired together and two more that fired together. So apparently, what happened uh, is one or two, one set fired out, the other set probably jammed because I hadn't used one set. So I only had three, and I don't know which one jammed, but one, one set probably jammed. 
because they were prone to do that one quit. So I had no more 20 millimeter, uh, and I had one five inch Zuni left. Zunis were an interesting weapon if you were, you know, firing something hardened, but they were virtually useless against most things we were going to see. Any more questions? Sure. Did any F8s finally show up? Hold on. Which is why I think they were on board. No, they, they never came. And uh, seriously, it, it, that thing that Pete did was, was just so typical of our attitude is that, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm deadly serious. We, when, when he said that, I said, yeah, we, we had this attitude that we're, we're better because we have to do better. He called it the Jackie Robinson syndrome, you know. <laughs> we, we're the last of a breed here. We're the last of a self-start, you know, era. And we, 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 we weren't cocky. We never bragged about it, but we believed we could do anything. And when, when I said, did we take care of those meetings? No. Who got to make that? Yeah. Oh, nobody else? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, it was pretty obvious that you had a Interesting question. Uh, I, uh, one of my best friends back here was a CEO of a, a A6 a squadron later, and all, that, uh, all kind of time in the A6. I, I should defer that to Bruce. Um, I, the, the author, uh, Stephen Kuntz, I've read a lot of his books. He's a great author. I, I, I love He's a great guy. Uh, I don't think that was his best book, personally. Uh, I, the movie was okay. I didn't fly the A6 in North Vietnam or anywhere. I just flew it in the med. Uh, Bruce, what do you think of the movie? He thought it was fantastic, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't relate one way or the other. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was, it was uh, top, don't get me wrong about Top Gun. Top Gun was filmed with the Navy's cooperation. Oh, it was a, it was a recruiting tool for, for the Navy. And Top Gun School itself was very, very, very successful. 
I just wanted to draw the distinction between, remember those Iceman, I think, flu, and I, I don't know if I related either one, but I would be Iceman rather than Tom Cruise, or whoever he was, if, if I could choose how to be remembered. Okay. All right. Mr. Spalding, still right? Yeah. Thumbs down from the pot. Okay, so we're like, oh, one more. Could you take just a few minutes, sir, to uh, address uh, Carrier Ops, planning the Skyrider board the Carrier, or some of the flying qualities? Okay. Well, it, it, as I mentioned very briefly, I actually was an LSO, and I got a real privilege. I got picked very early on. The CAG LSOs uh, wanted to qualify somebody in a hurry, so actually uh, I got qualified to be uh, an LSO when we first got to Vietnam, uh, and it was my first full cruise. I just got, uh, and so I got a chance not only to fly it aboard, but to train and evaluate other people. And I got a chance to wave A4s and later on F4s and A3s and vigilantes and all that. The, the carrier qualities of the SPAD were better than a Vigi, but really bringing the SPAD aboard was probably a little more dangerous in my opinion than maybe an A4 or an F4, uh, only because it uh, tail wheel, uh, it had a, a, a huge, huge torque from that engine, and that means that when you're slow, if you have to put on power quickly, it's going to turn you upside down or something. The, the old guys, there's some here I'm sure that flew it back in Korea, I think their approach speed was something like 88 knots or something, above stall but still real slow. Somebody figured out by the time I got in it to fly it at 92 roughly as the target speed aboard the, uh, in fact, when I car qualified in, in the replacement air grid, we did 88, but real quickly they went to 92. It made it a lot safer, took away the torque roll. If you're at 92 or uh, in that low 90s, uh, you, you're not as likely to, but when you're real slow, anybody's ever flown at any point, when you're down near stall speed, you put the plane power on real quickly, it'll, it'll jerk around. Well, SPAD, you put power on real quickly, you've got so much power, it's just going to go bloop, and you're going to go in the water. And there were a lot of people who got killed with it early on from that. Uh, there were other characteristics that made it a little bit tough. You needed a little short, small guys had trouble with it because you got to reach the rudder and all that. You need to manhandle the plane a lot. Uh, uh, you know, there's been some great carrier planes. Uh, it, it, it was much better than the Corsair, which uh, the, the Corsair, you couldn't see over it. They had to learn to, and I love the Corsair approach. I always said, oh, so tough people. I didn't want people to be long straight away. I wanted them to be turning all the way that I'm talking about. But it was a good carrier plane. It was, it was, it was an excellent plane in so many respects. Uh, everything, every plane has some trade-offs. But uh, I can tell you, you know, the, the, the planes that I waved, that, the A3 and the, and the A5, the Vigilante, were the toughest character planes. All right, well, listen, I'll, I'll be around uh, just one more. Well, one more question right. involving F8s. Later, they had F8s on the Intrepid, right? Later in the war, and I was uh, wondering if it was a result of your no. experience of not having any fight. No, no, I don't think they, they, they may have. I don't know if they did. I don't think they did. They did. The reason we had no fighters and the reason we had no other planes is the mission was supposed to be down south, but there was no reason for it. And then they changed that. But the Intrepid, I think, reverted back to ASW. Uh, I don't know that they ever had fighters aboard that or not. I'm not sure. It, it made a couple more crews. Did it? Okay. Well, then they would have put a full complement on, wouldn't they? They had a couple three squadrons of A4s. Then it, yeah, there you go. Yeah, see, like, a uh, regular airplane normally had attack fighters and hopefully some ECM birds. Well, I, I've been around if anybody wants to corner me somewhere, and uh, I'm sure he's got some work. Well, we got a break, Mother Nature's out there, so uh, we're going to go ahead and crank the Saturday and plan to be flying out there. She's got to fly out there and crank her up.